of the weekly history seminar sponsored by the National History Center and uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Christian Osterman and I would like to uh, get the uh, seminar off to a good start by being punctual as well as having uh, uh, a kind of ending to the seminar. Uh, we propose to meet for about an hour and a half uh, and to let people uh, think in terms of about 5.30. Uh, this is just to give people in part the assurance that you won't be trapped uh, in a lengthy uh, meeting. Uh, it's our great pleasure today to have Stan Katz with us. Uh, I have actually been given a Woodrow Wilson blurb uh, to read about Stan, uh, I would you don't have to read it right like <laughs> to think that everyone knows about uh, Stan's uh, distinction as a legal scholar, a legal historian, as well as about a historian of many things, including uh, philanthropy. Uh, and everyone will know, of course, about his blog, uh, his writings for the uh, various journals on higher education. Uh, and so I thought I would slightly give a, a different note to this introduction because I was uh, uh, earlier today in touch with someone from Oxford. And I was reminded that the purpose of an introduction in Oxford is quite different from what it is here. It's to throw the, try to throw the speaker just a little bit off stride. Uh, so I wanted to mention that Stan at one time had a rather weird connection with uh, Sir Louis Namier, uh, the great historian of the American Revolution, among other great works. Uh, Namier was, I mentioned him in this regard because Namier was always, uh, I'll let you explain the relationship, uh, interested in the question, in whose interest is it? In other words, human rights at the time of the uh, American Revolution as well as the French Revolution uh, would have been more than an ethical interest to Namier. He would have asked in whose question, in whose interest uh, are we pursuing human rights? And I think this is certainly one of the questions that uh, Stan will be asking in relation to the United States. And just to go worldwide at the other extreme, it's an issue that can be discussed in regard to microstates as well. For example, Pitt Cairn, uh, where the uh, issue of human rights, uh, the abuse of human rights is being played out uh, in the New Zealand uh, judicial system. Uh, so, Stan, you may speak about whatever you want, whether it's about Pitcairn or Sir Louis Namier, uh, perhaps even human rights. Stan Katz. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, Christian. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess I have to explain what my relationship to Sir Lewis was. Uh, I, I went to uh, London to write my doctoral dissertation. I got my degree from an American university, but I was writing about the relationship between uh, uh, New York politics and British politics in the middle of the 18th century, and uh, Namir was the only person in the world who was really an expert on that sort of thing. and the. The weirdness of the relationship was this. Uh, Sir Lewis had retired at this point. He had an office in the basement of Senate House at the University of London. And so the arrangement was I would go there every weekday for tea. Um, but it wasn't done to talk business at tea. So I would meet him before tea in the men's room. Uh, which was adjacent to the tea room. Um, and the men's room was very famous, actually, because uh, it had a typical, I assume it was the same as the ladies, but a roll towel, um, except that there was a brass towel rack and with a brass plaque over it saying Sir Louis Namier. And there was a hand towel that only Sir Lewis could, and <laughs> only in the UK, I'm sure no one else ever used that hand towel. So we would, and what our relationship was this, by the way, that he would ask me for details about the family connections of Americans who were influential in Parliament, and in return for that, he would tell me about the British politicians I was interested in, and I had to come prepared each week to give him at least one fact he didn't know so that he, what he would do for me was to arrange to visit a stately house so that I could read papers. So it was invaluable to my research. Okay. Um, 
This is a slightly long paper, and I'm only going to read parts of it, and I wave your hands if I've skipped something that makes it impossible to know uh, what I'm talking about. I would like to preface it by saying, um, uh, since Philippa asked me about this beforehand, that to my pleasure, the history of human rights um, has become a field um, in the last several years. I don't know how many uh, exactly. And there's some very interesting, I think quite distinguished work on it. I was pointing out before, I'm not going to talk about this book, but if, if you're interested in the subject and you haven't read Lynn Hunt's book, you should. I think it's really uh, a magnificent and quite unusual book. She draws on sources such as novels, which most historians of human rights wouldn't have thought to use, and it's an entirely imaginative use of history. Um, but uh, Elizabeth Borgward, for instance, among the uh, American historians, has recently published a fine book. Alas, I think, in some ways, the, the most interesting of the historians of the United States and human rights was my doctoral student, my late doctoral student, Ken Camille from the University of uh, of Iowa, who died a very untimely death four or five years ago, it was beginning a huge project on the topic that I'm going to talk to you about today. It was tr tremendous loss to us. But at any rate, it has become a subject now. So um, my, uh, my objective here is to explore the historical reasons why the United States hasn't been able to participate fully in the international uh, human rights system. Uh, and in talking about this, I'm not so much interested in the political and social reasons for American hesitance to embrace the international system. One could cite temerity, isolationism, arrogance, imperialism, mean-spiritedness. You can think of a lot of negatives that have, have been attributed to us to explain it. I'm more interested in the underlying elements of our constitutional history and structure that have made it hard for our nation to do the right thing by way of constitutional human rights, uh, even for those of us Americans who are favorably inclined uh, to do so. So I want to start by referring to the uh, international um, treaty uh, system, which is the basis of public international law. And to remind you that uh, our Constitution, the 1787 Constitution, doesn't say much about international law. The most obvious reference is the delegation to Congress of the power to, quote, define and punish offenses against the law of nations, which is how international law was referred to. But until recently, this was respected, restricted to its textual pairing in the Constitution with the power, quote, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas. And there is a body of opinion that says that that's all that was intended uh, by the uh, law of nations in the Constitution. The normal method for committing the U.S. to international norms has, of course, been by the formal adoption of treaties and covenants. And this comes from the constitutional power uh, of the President by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. And it's a potentially sweeping power. I think we sometimes forget how sweeping it is. For it's amplified by Article 6, Section 2, which says the treaties are made um, under the authority of the United States, like the constitutions and statutes made in accordance with it, shall be the supreme law of the land. So you can't get any better than, than that. So treaties are something which constitutionally we ought to take uh, very seriously at almost all um, international law, uh, as it applies to us, comes to us by way of the treaty uh, power. Now, the most uh, effective limitation on the applicability of international human rights treaties has been the doctrine that multilateral human rights treaties, and that's what they mostly are, are non-self-executing and thus not directly enforceable. All that means is that you can't obviously go to a federal court and cite the treaty as the basis of law unless the treaty has been, in effect, reenacted by Congress. And there's a debate about this, but that's what it means to be uh, uh, non-self-executing. Uh, there is no U.S. Supreme Court case uh, on point, uh, but both state and federal courts have followed the doctrine of the California Supreme Court in, say, Fuji versus State, which held that human rights covenants of the United States are not self-executing. 
That is, they can't be cited in court um, on their own two feet, as it were. Um, and as a prominent scholar has uh, commented, the self-executing versus non-self-executing distinction is perhaps less relevant than it might appear given the poor record of U.S. ratification of international human rights treaties. We certainly cannot execute treaties we do not ratify or human rights treaties that we emasculate with reservations, understandings, and declarations, and I will come back to explain what those are in a couple of minutes. But let's not forget how high the stakes are here. They're very high. Paul Lauren, the scholar Paul Lauren, makes the point that the entire notion of the law of nations was profoundly transformed uh, in the decades after the uh, promulgation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this is what Lauren says. And not everyone, I think, appreciates this change. Under traditional and heavily entrenched international law, only states possess legal standing and recogni enjoyed recognized rights. This horizontal system between sovereign states ruled supreme, and individuals remained outside international law. But with the advent of this whole body of legal instruments in the form of binding covenants and conventions with monitoring bodies, the system has increasingly changed into a more vertical uh, arrangement whereby individual men, women, and children find themselves being increasingly transformed into legitimate subjects of international law to be legally respected and entitled to the protection of their rights against violations by their own governments as well as by other states. So it's a sea change. So at least potentially, it means each of us uh, can appeal to international law as against our own state. Thus, the currently emerging human rights regime not only threatens state sovereignty, but also promises to empower citizens of laggard states both to imagine and seek recognitions of rights not protected at home in their own states. As I will argue later, this is a pe peculiarly unwelcome notion in the United States, whether or not we are a laggard state. Uh, and in fact, the specter of the enforcement of foreign rights norms for our citizens has haunted some Americans throughout most of our national history. We were, after all, among the last of the so-called civilized nations to join the international movement to abandon the system of human bondage. Even as late as the negotiations to create the League of Nations, President Wilson, here we are, uh, fought the efforts of the Japanese and others to introduce a clause into the League Charter declaring a right to uh, racial equality. However, to be fair, it might have been because Wilson knew the Senate would never ratify the League Treaty if such a clause were included. Now, Senator James Reed of Missouri, during a debate about U.S. entrance into the League, blurted out, think of submitting questions involving the very life of the United States, this is on the floor of the Senate, to a tribunal on which a nigger from Liberia, a nigger from Honduras, a nigger from India, each have votes equal to that of the great United States. Or, more diplomatically, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts declared, we do not want a narrow alley of escape from the jurisdiction of the lead. We want to prevent any jurisdiction whatever. But I don't want to put too much emphasis on the World War I experience. Uh, my focus is on the period uh, of uh, history of human rights after World War II. And I want to briefly review how far they have come since then and what progress they have made and failed to make in this country. As the West caught its first glimpses of the horrors of Nazism, it seemed clear that conscientious response to totalitarianism required the energetic defense of the rights to liberty and security that had been so thoroughly violated during the first four decades of the 20th century. As early as 1941, Franklin Roosevelt had called, called for a world formed upon four essential freedoms. And shortly after America entered the war, the Allies made human rights an explicit goal of the war, declaring, quote, complete victory over their enemies essential to preserve human rights and justice in their own lands as well as in other lands, end quote. Uh, the idea of international human rights first surfaced in the United States at the ALI, the American Law Institute, uh, our most prestigious national legal association. In 1942, the ALI appointed a committee of lawyers and political scientists. Uh, Daniel Burston, by the way, was well, a very young Daniel Burston was one of them, to examine the world's cultures in order to compile a uh, tentative international bill of rights. Uh, 
The committee reported to the ALI governing body in 1944, but the Council decided against further attempts to draft an international Bill of Rights. It's an interesting story. The bottom line is that the ALI chickened out on the grounds that it would get itself into politics by moving forward on those uh, tracks. I said, I have to apologize, I already said something wrong. It wasn't Dan Borston. Um, it was, um, I'll come back to it. I'm blacking on a name. Nevertheless, David Reisman. It was his first job. Nevertheless, when the United States, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and China met at Dumbarton Oaks in late 1944 to negotiate the charter of an international organization to replace the League of Nations, their enthusiasm for human rights was already waning, uh, and all except China, uh, tragically, in view of that country's subsequent history, were united in opposition to any meaningful human rights provisions. The Senate had already resolved that the United States membership in any such international organization should be conditioned on a strong domestic jurisdiction clause. And it's no surprise then that the official briefing that our delegates took to the San Francisco Peace Conference contained not a single agenda item relating to human rights. The charter of the UN signed by 44 nations in 1945 took greater account of human rights than the US, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain had intended but it was the vocal support for human rights by America's own civil society, 42 U.S. non-governmental organizations were short-sightedly invited by the State Department to the San Francisco Conference as consultants that forced it to take the lead in giving human rights their prominent place in the U.N. Charter. This is, by the way, the first international act by NGOs that actually mattered in this, uh, in this field. Um, prominent, but still not enforceable. National sovereignty and domestic jurisdiction continued to stand in the way of enforceability, and so emerged Article 2, Section 7 of the Charter, quote, nothing contained in the present Charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state or shall require members to submit such matter to settlement, end quote. American ambivalence toward human rights continued even as Eleanor Roosevelt was chosen as chairperson of the preparatory committee established to draft recommendations for the UN's Commission on Human Rights, and as she was then unanimously elected chair of the commission itself. Enforceability continued to be a sticking point for the United States. In 1947, as her commission deliberated about an international bill of rights, Roosevelt received instructions from our government that these deliberations should lead to no more than a declaration of principles and that any discussions about mechanisms for enforcement, quote, should be kept on a tentative level and should not involve any commitments of this government, end quote. Thus it was that the product that emerged in December 1948 was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and not a binding convention. Nevertheless, as Jeffrey Robertson has noted, the Declaration was an imperishable statement that has inspired more than 200 international treaties, uh, conventions, and declarations, and the bills of rights found in almost any every national constitution uh, adopted since the war. It is, as everyone here will know, a magnificent document. But by the way, I give a lot of courses for American history teachers. I've yet to meet one who's ever read the Universal Declaration, and I'm not aware that it's ever assigned in high school classes, so it's not very well known in this country, I think. Although the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was non-biting, Article 28 did decree that, quote, everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized, end quote. So in 1948, the General Assembly set the Commission on Human Rights to work drafting a treaty that would require the domestic law of ratifying states to guarantee the human rights of their citizens. Yet, in 1953, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was recalled from the Commission on Human Rights, although she still had two years of her term remaining. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles announced that the United States would not become party to any UN uh, human rights treaty, and perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by this turn of events. The practical reasons for joining the United Nations, combined with the efflorescence of democratic ideals following World War II, 
had helped the proponents of ratification of the UN Charter avoid the disaster of the League experience. But the internationalist enthusiasm of the post-war period soon gave way to the historic fear of foreign entanglements with the onset of McCarthyism and the resurgence of neo-isolationism in the 1950s. This reaction was most overtly expressed in the efforts of Ohio Senator John Bricker and other isolationist and mostly Midwestern senators to introduce what came to be known as the Bricker Amendment in 1953. The three sections of this proposed amendment were a straightforward attempt to enable Congress to prevent the use of treaties to override the Constitution and statutory law. The first section says, a provision of a treaty which conflicts with this Constitution shall not be of any force or effect. That's, by the way, a very interesting provision, and we might want to talk about that later. The second one says, a treaty shall become effective as internal law in the United States only through legislation which would be valid in the absence of a treaty. You can see what, what they're driving at here. But beyond simple constitutional conservatism, and it is that, Bricker was especially antagonistic toward the draft UN covenants on human rights. He characterized the covenant as a covenant on human slavery, uh, this is all his language, a legalization of the most vicious restrictions of dictators, a legal basis for the most repressive measures of atheistic tyranny, an attempt to repeal the Bill of Rights, a threat to freedom of religion, and a blueprint for tyranny. Uh, lest you th think that um, the extreme language we see these days is new, it's not. For Bricker, the amendment was necessitated by the pressures of the Cold War, and here's what he said. The communist drive for world domination, through a divisive influence in one sense, inspires the non-communist world to seek increased safety in collective security arrangements, economic as well as military in character. All these influences have led in turn to proposals to curb the power of the nation state by subordinating it to some measure of control by supranational organizations. Now that's, I think, a straightforward uh, expression of a real constitutional fear. Uh, but he went on to say there was something much larger at stake, and this is what he said. What this amendment would, in essence, do is to keep the rights of the American people in the spiritual realm and not place them in the temporal power of an international government which is controlled by countries which are totalitarian in their philosophy and seem to have no concept of the God-given inalienable rights that the people of America enjoy. And you can hear the trumpets in the background, I think. Now, I don't want to exaggerate Bricker's importance. The proposed amendment never made it out of the Senate. Uh, most of its supporters were the minority who supported Joe McCarthy uh, in the censure motion. And they were represented a small, extremely conservative, isolated and isolationist minority in the Eisenhower Republican Party. Uh, Eisenhower himself said in January 54, I am unalterably opposed to the Bricker Amendment. Adoption in its present form would be noticed to our friends as well as our enemies abroad that our country intends to withdraw from its leadership in world affairs. The inevitable reaction would be of major proportions. On the other hand, Dulles announced that the Eisenhower administration would not submit the two, N two UN treaties on human rights to, uh, to the Senate, and such treaties, quote, should or lawfully can be used as devices to circumvent the constitutional procedures established in relation to what are essentially matters of domestic concern. So to some extent, he buys the Bricker argument, although not the solution. My point is simply that Bricker, who couched his opposition in constitutional terms, touched a deep nerve in the historic American attitude toward U.S. participation in the international human rights movement through the treaty mechanism. In retrospect, his position seems quite weak constitutionally since he sought an amendment out of fear that the existing constitutional structure did not provide a sufficient barrier against norm creation by treaty. But the episode reveals an underlying sensitivity in our constitutional tradition with respect to human rights. And I think we've sort of forgotten about it at, at our peril. Um, it would, I think, come back in exactly that form uh, or a similar form were there a comparable um, attempt to push too hard on human rights now.
The United States on the whole remained aloof from the human rights treaties for several decades. We played almost no role in the formulation of either the International Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which along with the Universal De Declaration constitute the International Bill of Rights. We also stayed well away from those documents when they were open for signature in 1966. We refused to ratify the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, uh, which has been open for signature since 1948. There were minor exceptions. Uh, we did participate fairly actively in the Subcommission on Discrimination that produced the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination in 1965. And we acceded to the Convention on the Political Rights of Women in 1976, both of these pretty well fully covered by existing uh, American uh, uh, rights in any case. But real engagement with the growing body of treaties had to wait until the late 1970s, a very long time. President Carter signed the Civil Covenant in 1977, uh, sent it on to the Senate for ratification the following year, along with three other human rights treaties and a series of crippling reservations. In his letter of transmittal, Carter wrote, quote, the great majority of the substantive provisions of these four treaties are entirely consistent with the letter and spirit of the United States Constitution and laws. Uh, the response, of course, to that was, why do we need them um, in that case? Uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee held three days of hearings uh, on these treaties in 1979, but reached no conclusion and didn't report them out. Then events intervened to stymie further pr progress because the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, and the Iran hostage crisis, it's funny how history keeps coming around uh, again, um, uh, took place uh, uh, at the same time, the Soviet, uh, uh, just as President Reagan took office in 1981. The new administration displayed no interest in ratifying the Civil Covenant and instead chose to focus on ratifying the Genocide Convention, uh, which had been uh, before the Senate since Truman had transmitted it 40 years earlier. The ratification of the Genocide Convention, in fact, did take place in 1988 with the attachment of an encompassing reservation by the United States, quote, that nothing in the convention requires or authorizes legislation or other action by the United States prohibited by the Constitution of the United States as interpreted by the United States, end quote. Um, in August 1991, uh, President Bush, President Herbert, George Herbert Walker Bush, urged the committee to reconsider the Civil Covenant, which it did in November. Uh, and after a unanimous vote the following March, the commission favorably reported the treaty to the full Senate for formal approver, approval, which was granted in April 1992. That's the first of the components of the International Bill of Rights accepted by the United States, 1992, along with the customary package of reservations, understandings, and declarations. These are the things that you tack on, any a country can tack on, to specify its understanding of the treaty, which it has just signed on to, in this case, ratified. And there is a technical distinction among these things. They're called in the, in the field as RUDs, reservations, understandings and declarations. Um, they're very much like the presidential signing statements which we've come to know about since. October 1994 was, however, a good month for UN treaties in the United States. That month saw the ratification of two further treaties, the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. Those would have sounded like odd words uh, until uh, recently, um, the Reagan administration had laid much of the groundwork for this ratification in the International Covenant on, of the, on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, again, with many reservations, understandings, and declarations, 13 in all. But other important human rights treaties, such as the Economic, Economic Covenant and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, remain to this day unratified by the United States. The International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families remains unsigned by the United States. Um, on July 31, 2002, uh, the Foreign Relations Committee approved the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, uh, but we haven't followed through on that. The result is that the United States participates in the UN Treaty 
uh, regime in a partial, inconsistent, and ambivalent fashion, and that such international documents don't constitute rules of law for American courts charged with protecting similar individual and group rights domestically. And a uh, section of the paper where I say more about the Rudds, but I'm running on too long and I'm not going to say uh, more, uh, more about it. But when you look over this whole scenario, you see both that we have signed on to many fewer of these documents. Uh, we have, when we have signed on to them and then ratified them, uh, we have uh, limited them severely um, by express uh, limitations. So that's the international treaty system. The other possible way, and I'm not going to go into this, of uh, uh, adhering to international law is through customary international law. And in fact, the, the rule of constitutional law in this country, going back to John Marshall, is that we will respect customary international law. And there is a rich body of customary international law relating to human rights over a long period of time. But by and large, the federal courts do not follow it so that it hasn't been of much use to, uh, to litigants. Uh, the other possible way in which this might uh, happen, or in addition to that, uh, again, something that I don't have time to go into in any detail here, but we could talk about it later, is through the simple uh, adoption by uh, the American uh, uh, federal courts of foreign law where they think it's appropriate. And as some of you will know, there has been an intense discussion in fairly recent years of whether or not it's even appropriate to cite uh, foreign law um, in constitutional litigation in this, uh, in this country. Uh, the, the language in, uh, in all of this uh, discussion has been heated, to say, uh, to say the least. Um, and it won't surprise you that the, mo the more conservative members of the court have been adamantly uh, against such citation, uh, although Justice Kennedy, uh, among the, the five who sometimes form a conservative majority on the court, um, has in fact, in the uh, famous uh, Texas case, uh, appealed uh, to the European courts, Court of Human Rights. So there may be some hope in that. But Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, uh, the late Justice Rehnquist, all had absolutely scathing things to say uh, about it, for instance, in, in a case called Atkins versus Virginia, in which Justice Stevens had cited a European Union amicus curiae brief. Um, uh, Justice Scalia said, we must never forget uh, that it is a constitution for the United States of America that we are expounding, where there is not, a, where there is not first a settled consensus among our own people the views of other nations, however enlightened the justices of this court may think them to be, cannot be imposed upon Americans through the Constitution. Um, and there were similar responses to, for instance, Justice Scalia again, although he's not the only one, responding to uh, Justice Kennedy in Lawrence versus Texas, uh, said that um, uh, uh, Scalia refers to a Canadian judicial imposition um, of uh, homosexual marriage uh, in rebuttal, um, while it is conceivable that the judiciary may, be, uh, may become more open to considerations of foreign values through analyses of customary international law, uh, it's not going to happen, uh, in effect, he said, on my watch. And he's not the only justice to think that. So I want to conclude then by asking how we came to be in this position. This is the question that really interests me. All this is just laying out on the table uh, where we are. And my argument, um, and I conclude by saying, is that uh, we are where we are because of where we are coming from. Uh, the legacy of the 20th century uh, is that we in the United States uh, have mainly a tenuous and formalistic relationship to the international human rights system. And in order to understand it, I think you have to look at what I would say are the three sort of uh, key elements of our uh, constitutional tradition from this point of view. The first is our peculiarly strong textualist constitutional tradition. Um, this you'll be familiar with. In the 1780s, the United States produced two of the world's first written national constitutions with the Articles of Confederation and the 1787 Constitution. Um, but our earlier colonial tradition had rested heavily on authoritative texts, 
the great British constitutional text and the several colonial charters. Uh, the irony is, of course, that our constitutional tradition is that of uh, Great Britain, which is the most famous unwritten constitution in the world. But nevertheless, we rested our case on written charters. And when uh, the Declaration of Independence is an example of when push came to shove, how important that was uh, to us. Um, but since that time, whatever our politics or ideology, Americans seek desperately to justify our beliefs and actions by reference to the Constitution's text. Moreover, we're not only committed to uh, a brief and somewhat cryptic text, but we've submitted ourselves to the primacy of judicial interpretation of the text. Uh, Lewis Henkin of Columbia noted that from the earliest days of uh, Chief Justice John Marshall's assertion of judicial control of constitutional interpretation, quote, the text became all. What was written is the effective constitution. The justices felt constrained to look only to the text. What was not there was excluded, end quote. So we have a short, long-standing, judicially interpreted text. The text, one must also note, has seldom been amended. So restrictive are the provisions of Article 5 specifying the amendment process. None of this had to be so, but it is the constitutional tr tradition we have built, sustained, and accepted, and I think we're stuck with it. Um, and I'm not trying to make here an originalist argument. Although we have barely changed the constitutional text, we have, of course, introduced many innovations by way of judicial interpretation and acquisition to novel changes in practice. This is why we are so exercised by the uh, character of judicial change. The debate over the Citizens Union case that just came down uh, is not so much, I think, a debate about its impact on elections as about what the justices are entitled to do. And I think that's what the case will go down uh, for. Um, our constitutional tradition has witnessed extraordinary and totally extra textual changes in relations between the states and the federal government, between the executive and the legislature, and the creation of wholly new processes and entities of government, just to name a, a few. Now, the second element of our tradition um, has been its close association with po popular sovereignty. I think this has been less frequently appreciated. The United States may not have invented modern constitutionalism, although I think we did, but we surely innovated the formal relationship between constitutionalism and popular sovereignty. Here, the central idea was that of ratification. In the American tradition, we rigidly separate the functions of legislation and constitution making, as opposed to the legislative constitution making approaches of most contemporary parliamentary slash civil law countries. Think of the differences in the German uh, tradition, for instance. The American system requires specially elected bodies to propose constitutional texts and either separate ratifying body or the submission of text to the electorate for approval. The legislature doesn't do it with a supermajority, as it might in most European countries. As Gordon Wood has demonstrated in his great creation of the American Republic, a radical theory of the derivation of the Constitution directly from the sovereign people was necessary to defend the politically contrived Constitution from anti-federalist charges that an anti-populist convention had stolen government from the people, which of course it had. Uh, Federalist writers like James Wilson, speaking in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, made the point explicit, arguing that the legitimate source of power did not come from state governments, quote, for in truth it remains and flourishes with the people, end quote. He continued that the source of legitimate power, quote, resides in the people, all caps, as the fountain of government, end quote. So forth he goes on in that vein. Despite the fact that the people, as opposed to the judiciary, have been so little involved in formal constitution making in modern American history, the historic federalist sense of the tight fit between popular sovereignty and constitutional validity makes it hard for Americans to acknowledge the constitutional legitimacy of even the most admirable foreign constitutional institutions and norms. We simply do not accept that the United Nations or any other international body embodies the will of the American people sufficiently for it to establish rules enforceable in American courts. We are all Brickerites to this extent. 
especially wary of the possibility that exogenous norms will be bootstrapped into the domestic order by treaty, executive agreement, or otherwise. This is an integral part of our American constitutional personality, and it's increasingly in tension with the globalism of higher values. For Americans, international human rights, as they might be assimilated into our Constitution, threaten the creation of a disturbing democratic deficit, which is really to put Senator Bricker's basic intuition into polite language. For most Americans, the adoption of such important values, at least insofar as they are new values, requires a formal constitutional act invoking popular sovereignty. We do, after all, have an available constitutional mechanism to support international human rights. But effective constitutionalism anywhere depends upon the continuing support of the people for its underlying values. Whether in the United States such support for the broadest forms of universal rights exists or can be created through politics or programs of public education is a separate question. And by the way, since I first wrote these words, um, having spent some time thinking about the Tea Party movement, uh, I'm not at all sure um, that the American people would support these norms. The third factor that I want to mention in the dilemma of American Constitution that makes it difficult for us to buy into the international norms is our sharp, sharply defined and somewhat idiosyncratic rights tradition. The American nation emerged out of a struggle for the rights of Englishmen, and it briefly articulated its understanding of rights as natural rights in the preamble to the Declaration of the Independence. But much more significantly, as uh, Gerald Sturz uh, has pointed out, the Americans innovated by constitutionalizing the rights of persons. That's the direction it worked for us. It was a dual process, and Sturz puts it this way. On the one hand, natural rights were reduced, if one may put it this way, to the level of constitutional rights, what German authors have described using a phrase that Christian could pronounce, but I can't. Um, Exactly. <laughs> On the other hand, the process of constitutionalizing individual rights also included the raising of various rights of English common law or parliamentary origin, particularly procedural rights, to the level of constitutional rights. That's Schwartz. In other words, by the time we adopted the Bill of Rights in 1791, we had narrowed our rights orientation to that narrow set of rights explicitly written into the First Amendments to the Constitution. It was an exploding concept, I think. You know, the process of constitutionalization limits our conception of rights to those listed in or construed from the Bill of Rights, which were almost entirely negative in character. The problem after the Revolution, after all, was to protect the rights of Englishmen from incursions by our own government. And the Bill of Rights was primarily aid, aimed at preventing governmental abuse of the rights of citizens. To be sure, some rights are stated positively, the free exercise of religion, freedom of speech and press, the right to bear arms. But the form of each guarantee is one against the government. Congress shall make no law. Uh, for Americans, the Bill of Rights says to the state, thou shall not. And of course, the mysterious Ninth Amendment assures us, as it was intended to assure the Anti-Federalists, that, quote, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, end quote, whatever they may be. So while in principle the first eight amendments do not claim to be exhaustive or exclusive, in reality, uh, American constitutional parsimoniousness and textuality have not admitted of the judicial creation of numerous new constitutional rights. Even the Reconstruction Amendments, and in particular the 14th Amendment, have not introduced many broad new rights, and none that is a positive right. As I argued some years ago, the guarantee of equal protection of the laws is a far cry from the mandate of equality. That is not what is guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Whereas normative equality, undergirds the structure of much international human rights law. I think our law is fundamentally at odds with international human rights law, at least in uh, spirit. So uh, there are uh, substantive reasons, quite apart from our constitu constitutional tradition, uh, that the United States has been at best reluctant to create positive rights. Uh, 
our weak state tradition, our historic antagonism to socialism, our tradition of individual liberal, uh, liberal individualism, sorry, and so forth. But all these move in the direction of middle of the road, liberal economic democracy, a tendency that was strengthened dramatically during the Cold War. Franklin Delano Roosevelt may have hoped to constitutionalize the New Deal when he included freedom from want as one of the four freedoms. But despite Mrs. Roosevelt's tireless efforts to include it in the UN human rights documents, the principle cannot seriously be considered part of our constitutional tradition and look at the debate over health care. If what President Obama is proposing is socialism, you know, it makes the point, I think. The constitutional version of the Cold War was a conflict between the forces of civil and political rights and those of social and economic rights. We in the West argued that if free, free market-based democracies ensured political and civil rights, um, they would then move in the direction of a prosperity that would benefit all sectors of society. Uh, the communists, on the other hand, argued that it would only be if the state could guarantee such rights as those of jobs, housing, and health care that a decent society could be created. You can't eat votes, we were told. Uh, apart from Cuba, there are a few places where the communist constitutional claim is still maintained. But it has long been the case that the underdeveloped and post-colonial world has accepted the primacy of positive social and economic rights. The point here is simply that to American ears, the International Covenant on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights still sounds dangerously similar to Soviet, the Soviet position on rights, however widely supported in the world the position may now be. When I read sections of that to my high school teachers, they cannot believe what I am telling them. It doesn't sound like a constitutional document to them. We say they are the same old social and economic rights, and we say to hell with them. This position is, for better or worse, as American as apple pie, and it constitutes an independent source of the U.S. human rights dilemma. To be fair, it is sometimes the case that American rights practices are superior. Our legally enforceable norms are stronger than their international hum human rights analogs. But it may also be fair to say that Americans are pr particularly prone to rights ethnocentricity. We tend to think of our historical conception of rights as the only valid conception or at least that it is the best approach to constitutional rights, and this is not likely to change any time soon. Um, and I don't have time to say much more about that, but I do think that that is our uh, dilemma. And so the, the question would become then uh, that uh, our dilemma, I would say, is that by our own lights, we are too thoroughly constitutionalist in a very American way to make international human rights a matter of domestic jurisdiction. Um, I recognize that there are less admirable reasons why we hold ourselves apart. But if we are to sign on more fully to international human rights, we will have to rethink and reinvent some basic elements of our constitutional legacy and derive new strategies for constitutional action. More important, we will have to struggle to build a domestic political constituency in favor of constitutionalizing international human rights norms that satisfies the American popular sovereignty sensibility unless one thinks that a sufficiently powerful freestanding political human rights constituency can be built to somehow obviate the constitutional barriers. For the moment, I'm not optimistic that we are up to these challenges. And in fact, I think if you look at the struggles we've been having over the last 12 months, I think it's a good example of exactly what I'm talking about. Do we have the intellectual, political, normative, common ground in this country to agree that anything like positive rights are part of the legitimate constitutional heritage? I would like to think so, but I doubt it. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian and I will both take uh, questions. Uh, Stan, just to get the discussion going, uh, I thought I detected in your narration of the sequence of events that there might have possibly have been a turning point at the time of the San Francisco uh, conference. If the 
political configuration had been a little different if people had really seized the issue to rethink some of these basic problems at that time. But then as you carried on, I got the impression that it was rather doomed from the start anyway, the all-out embracement of human rights simply because of the nature of the uh, uh, American politics and the, our constitutional uh, uh, tradition. Is that more or less right, or might, it, might there have been a... No, I don't think there really was. I mean, I think we got as far as we got largely because of Mrs. Roosevelt um, and because of the pressure from the human rights. Uh, uh, well, they weren't so much human rights at that point, but from the NGOs that uh, put on pressure to that way. But the, the government, whether it was Democratic or Republican, was adamantly against um, our uh, acceptance of human rights norms in the document. And certainly they were adamantly against the UN itself having any power to enforce norms uh, of this kind. <clears throat> so, no, I mean, I don't think there's ever been a moment when it was likely. The interesting question, by the way, is what happens in the 1970s, and we might want to talk about that later. Uh, David Nichols. Well, we would ask for you, at least in these uh, initial sessions, to identify yourself. Yeah. Actually, if you could wait for the microphone since we're taping this. Okay. My name is David Nichols. I'm um, a, a historian at the State Department. I have a question. Um, in, in the 40s, when a lot of this is happening, is also the period when the international economic system is being formed with Bren Woods. And there, the US obviously had enormous influence on the system that resulted. Why is it that the international system, despite the great power of the U United States during the 20th century and following the Second World War, why is it that the system diverged so much from American practices so that Americans have seen it as such an alien thing? Well, I'm not sure that that's a funny way to, to put the question, if you don't mind my saying so. Um, I think the question is why we have remained so adamantly different over such a very long period of time. In most of these norms, um, well, I'm going to give you two answers to the case. The first answer is that, after all, if you take the notion of uh, human rights seriously and look at the document, they're universal human norms. That's to argue that they're the same for everyone in the same way everywhere. And it seems to me that's a conception that doesn't make any sense in terms of the political and constitutional history uh, of this country. I mean, we proudly claim, and I think we should be proud to claim, that we have a revolutionary tradition. And we defined our, our conception of liberty um, in terms of the struggle we had to relieve ourselves of what we saw as British tyranny. Um, and we argued to ourselves, at any rate, that it was the constitutional system, I would say, was a way of being true to our own historical experience. And I think that's the sort of good part of the Bricker tradition. There's something adamantly um, defending our own conception of ourselves. Now, I can understand that at all. So I think it cuts against the grain for a country with our historical tradition to see it in another way. To me, the miracle is that the United Kingdom has been able to integrate itself into the European Union in the way that it has. I have less difficulty understanding why Germany has, a little bit more with France. But the United Kingdom I simply don't understand at all because, after all, we got it all there. Uh, and the, the, this, the way in which those countries have been able to subordinate themselves to a supranational norm-creating system, I, I think, is really quite amazing. So the process I think you have to think about, if abstracting all this, is whether we can imagine a situation in which the United States could fully and meaningfully integrate itself into some sort of worldwide EU system. And, and we would have the rule of law in the Universal Declaration, I think. I can't imagine it. And I don't think that's because we're isolationists. I think it's some of these reasons that I mentioned. So I just find it hard to get my mind around. I see what you mean. Uh, Sonia Michelle. Hi, Sonia Michelle at the Wilson Center. Hi. Now, we met last year when you were, I was in right. Maryland. Um, 
This is a fascinating talk, and it touches on so many different issues. Um, in a sense, it seems that what you've made is an, yet another argument for American exceptionalism, and I'm sure you're aware of that. Yeah. Um, one of the, and, and another thing it seems to me you've done is you've, you've drawn a parallel between um, <clears throat> negative and pos positive rights on the one hand and human rights and welfare states. I mean, you, you, you're sort of conflated human rights with a welfare state on a global level. It's part of it, right. And so, um, one of the arguments that's often made about why the U.S. doesn't have a welfare state is not constitutionalism, but because of our racial and ethnic diversity. So could you draw on a homology between the U.S.'s w unwillingness to create a welfare state within itself and its unwillingness to enter into what would essentially be a global welfare state as defined by human rights, which are positive rights? Does that make any sense? Well, I think you see what you mean, and I, I may have overdone it if I sounded in the way that you reported it. I mean, I think the welfare state is part of it. So that I think the economic, social, social and cultural document does respond to that set of norms. But it's not the only part of it because there, there is a civil and political document uh, as well, and those are the two halves of the international uh, approach. Uh, historically, I think that has been an important part of it, and it means that it's not just us and the <coughs> socialists or neo-socialists, but it's all of the developing countries buy in. Um, into that, and I think it's not surprising that post-colonial people should see the world um, in uh, in that way. I, and I don't think so. Uh, I really do think, and, and it, this is an argument for exceptionalism. But look, I, I hope my own position is clear. I'm against it. Um, that is to say, uh, I would I would vote for the adoption and acceptance of international norms. But I'm a historian, and uh, this is one example, I think, of uh, a, a truly distinctive um, tradition um, that we have, and I think it creates some problems for us, and undoubted advantages to the system. But in this case, I think it really creates some problems. And I think maybe if you look, and I skipped over that part of the paper, but if you look at the debates such as they are that we've had about, in um, particularly in the United States Supreme Court, Court about the even reference to international uh, law, uh, it's really quite striking. I mean, I'm not aware at any rate of any other country where the, I can't think of anything, any other way to describe it, rude language that justices like Scalia and Clarence Thomas have used. It's, it's really not polite sometimes. Uh, and it's got to speak to some terribly deep antagonism. As I, I think it's a kind of Tea Party response, and that's real, and we have to, if that's correct, then we, ha then we have to deal with it. But if, if we can't even, you know, lawyers distinguish between uh, dispositive authority and persuasive authority, and none of the justices who have cited foreign law, law in the Supreme Court, and there are only half a dozen examples of this, have claimed that it was dispositive, that it was in itself a rule of law. The objection is to referring to it even as persuasive. That's, you know, that's pretty astonishing, yeah, I think. think it's that as being idiosyncratic in their language. Do you think it, it really reflects some deeper sense? I think it reflects something. I mean, these are two very intelligent and thoughtful people, and I don't understand why they go that far. We have an authority on constitutional law here. Rod Heller, raise right. your hand up. I'd like to follow the question. My name is Rod Heller. I'm a, a lawyer and, and business investor in town, but a historian uh, by uh, avocation. Uh, I was impressed, as the previous speaker was, by your reference to the positive rights internationally and the, in effect, negative uh, exposition of the Bill of Rights. And if you look at American history, almost all our struggles have been negative against the bank, against economic concentrations of power, against uh, government overreaching. And my question is whether that is in part due to the cultural character under which this country was formed. One of the seminal books these days, at least in the minds of many, is David Hackett Fisher's Four uh, British Folkways. And in it he stresses particularly the Scots-Irish influence, mm -hmm. the anti-government role. And to what degree, leaving the historical constitutionalism that you've outlined, do you attribute some of these to more root causes which Hackett Fisher tries to investigate. 
Well, I, I've never been entirely persuaded by that argument, but the general argument I, th I think I laid out, I agree with it entirely. I mean, I think that was the character of the American Revolution. I don't think it was a radical revolution. I don't think it was a revolution for some um, very generalized conception of individual freedom. I think it was a revolution against governmental tyra tyranny, against the individual in a quite specific way that may have a Scots-Irish component, but I, I think that there's a very clear and um, obvious political narrative there, and I've al that's always been my narrative of the American Revolution. So, and, you know, as far as I've got a specific narrative in mind, I, it's Gordon Woods, which has always been, for me, the most helpful. We were, by the way, um, exact contemporaries in graduate school, and the most discouraging um, uh, academic experience anyone could ever have would be to read Gordon's dissertation, was, which was in effect the creation of the American Republic when it was turned in as a dissertation. I, I remember thinking that maybe there might be some other business in which I would do better. Mercha <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Flip. Thank you. Uh, Mir Tongtan here at the Wilson Center. I, you referenced a couple of times the the mid 1970s, and and you know to to me, um, I think human rights took I don't want to say a central role, but, but certainly an important role in Congress, if not in the American judicial system, uh, during the late 70s after right. the signing of the Helsinki Accords, um, in in terms of of um, how Congress sort of pushed a human rights agenda in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And I was wondering, uh, do you see that as political expediency on the part of, of groups within Congress? We can st stick it to the commies, or was it something a little more um, more deep there where human rights as a general concept sort of like started taking hold? Yeah. Though mind you, certainly those were very similar in nature uh, to American civil right. rights right. constitution. Well, I mean, I think it's a really good uh, question. It's what I'm working on now is the the period of the 70s. Um, I think it's pretty thin in Congress. I don't think there's ever been a strong constituency in the Congress for uh, for human rights. And unfortunately, it, the way in which it has been um, expressed uh, is relevant to, to the State Department. So much of it uh, came as a result of the... Carter administration push for human rights, I think, was very real for the executive office uh, during those years. And we had the, uh, the creation of the first a sort of temporary and then an uh, assistant secretary slot for human rights. So we officially put it in. But it very quickly became part of foreign relations more generally. And I think it was a club to use against countries we didn't like. Um, and so the annual reporting mechanism is, I think, very frequently just exactly that. Uh, and it's made it very hard to get away from that. So we perhaps inevitably politicized it in a way that I think has made it very difficult. But I also think during the Cold War, it was almost impossible to isolate human rights from the other kinds of antagonisms and conflicts that were were going on, so it, it was really very difficult. I think Carter, for instance, tried, and that's why when uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan came along, it was it was all we had Iran too. Uh, it was all over. But to me, the interesting story there is not uh, political. It's not in the Congress. Uh, it's in the emergency NGOs, because almost all of the NGOs, uh, not just in America but certainly here in the states, were created in the 70s. And I think insofar as the movement has a foothold in this country, it's because of the activities of the NGOs and because of the possibility of creating international coalitions. And, and I think to be successful, what we've seen is they have to be issue focused. So maybe you can make it on landmines or uh, protection of children or some human trafficking, uh, issues like that we can get people perhaps to uh, agree on. What I'm skeptical about is more generic changes which w do I think run athwart of this constitutional political hurdle that we have. Dr. Strum and then Dr. Beveridge. <clears throat> Thank you. Philip Strum, Wilson Center. Stan, thanks so much. That, that's really, really intriguing and, and, and very persuasive. Um, a couple of questions. 
One is that um, given the emphasis in the United States on individual rights, do you see us moving even further away from the human rights community as treaties that seem to embody something of a move towards group rights, like uh, the uh, Treaty about Aboriginal Rights right. and so on and so forth, um, become more and more a dominant sure. part of, of CEDAW. Um, the human rights? Okay. Secondly, might some of our exceptionalism come not only from our emphasis on civil and political as opposed to social economic rights, but the specific nature of those rights. And I'm thinking here primarily of speech, our conception of speech, which is so different from mm -hmm. the rest of the world, and the way that has made not only our government but some NGOs in the United States wary of some of the treaties because mm -hmm. they, they foster a different conception of speech. And finally, just a little question. You said that um, the treaties, the, the declaration is not taught in the United States. Are you aware of any place where it is part of the I curriculum? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, well, on the, on the first one, I think, uh, you know, put your finger on something very important. As I said, I, I think the rights tradition we have is both negative, largely uh, a negative rights tradition, and, you know, the book I would have referred to is Isaiah Berlin, um, The Two Conceptions. Um, and I think ours it really is a negative tradition in a profound way, in a meaningful uh, sort of way. But it is also highly individual. And I don't know if you've ever read, but I've always been struck by the years ago, the piece that um, Owen Fiss wrote on uh, the constitutionality of group rights. We, we have a real problem with group rights just conceptually in American constitutional law, and I think it's for exactly this reason. So if you think you know, back to many of us were involved in the civil rights uh, struggle in law, and you know, the closest we could come was class actions. And a class action is a bad proxy for group rights. You have to define the members of a class in a rather <laughs> narrow and legalistic way. If we had a notion, a uh, compelling notion of group rights, obviously we, there would be certain things about women that would be constitutionally relevant. But you couldn't convince Chief Justice Berger and most of the justices of, of that, and so with other things. So yeah, I mean, I think that is, that is a real problem for us. And when you, again, when you read those documents, um, it's fun, by the way, to go through with the college teachers or high school teachers, for that matter, and actually to look at the terms that are in these documents, even in the civil and political one, because words like group and family and duty, just take those three, they don't exist in our constitutional law because for the, just exactly the reason you're, we have such an adamantly individualistic, negative, highly contextualized, I mean that's to me is the, in the American exceptionalism part of it. It really comes out of a very specific historical tradition. To that extent, I think we really are victims of our history. Yeah. Uh, Stan, I want to go back to the Supreme you Court. And, oh, excuse me, Albert Beveridge. I'm a, another Washington lawyer. Uh, and I've uh, wondered if this uh, reluctance to even look at other uh, systems and uh, forms of jurisprudence uh, is in some way related to the way we appoint judges, at least in the federal system, and it's even worse in some of the state systems where they're elected. And it seems to me it's a much more highly politicized process than exists in other places and therefore gets uh, the candidate uh, uh, taking positions or he, he yeah. actually arises from certain sure. uh, groups that are fundamentally against uh, a recognition case of foreign law of any validity whatsoever. And I've always thought the, the appointed process is an, ex, is an important function, at least yeah. how it's carried out. Yeah. I wonder what you thought. Well, I, I mean, I think that's clearly right. I don't think it's the only no. you know, factor. I think it's, it is a factor, a strong factor. Uh, but, I, you know, I would go to something more basic than that. Uh, as you know, um, most American law students, at least until recently, didn't learn any foreign law, and, and didn't learn, uh, or didn't know any foreign law, and didn't learn much international law. And if they did learn international law in your day or my day, 
they learn public international, they learn private, sorry, private international law. It's only recently we, we do public international law. And actually, I, I think the sort of effort I've been involved in that I'm proudest of from this point of view is that 20 years ago, um, uh, I had a big grant from the Ford Foundation to do, um, to try to create um, a field of comparative, um, international comparative constitutional law. And I think we've had some success with that. Now, there are three case books. It's taught in the elite law schools, at any rate. Uh, and so I, at least law students now, particularly if they go to elite institutions, are learning something about all this. And I think that's the first step. Um, they, they simply need to know more than they, they know. So I'm sort of modestly, modestly optimistic on that level. By the way, but having said what I said, of course, uh, Justice Scalia knows a lot of foreign law, so that's not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Hughes. Um, <clears throat> Tom Adams, I'm interested in uh, European welfare. I'm interested in European welfare, and several things you said uh, both about England and the continent made me want to turn this around and ask sort of about what's special about Europe, which has such an influence internationally. And I remember at the time of the Treaty of Maastricht, there was an article saying that uh, British lawyers were suddenly doing a lot of study of continental law because it, for very practical reasons right. they had to understand it. But I'm wondering from your point of view, especially having, you're having done uh, this comparative law, is there uh, something about the continental tradition and, and particularly its um, deep roots in Roman law and also from there also Roman sort of political ideas and that very it, long tradition from the Renaissance on and so on, how it affects even the relation between law and executive and all of those things, does that put a different cast on how they think of, of inter, right. their law as part of an international law sure. of nations almost? Sure. I will thank you, by the way. Your work has been very helpful to me, not in this, but in work that I do, on Sorry. other work that I do. Yeah, but I would put it slightly, slightly differently, and that is to say, um, you know, our tradition is the um, the Anglo tradition, essentially, and I think most, uh, certainly American lawyers have some sense of that tradition. So to that extent, it's not just American that we're talking about, but although there are very American aspects to it. But the common law system is, I think, the problem here, as opposed to the civil law system, because after all, all your, all other European um, countries derive from civil law. So in some sense, they derive from a system they consider more or less universal. And that's what it was, how it was conceived of at the time. And I think there is much easier to imagine universal principles, generic principles. And I think we think by analogy. We don't think in terms of universal principles. There's something about uh, common law reasoning that is not congenial. To, the, to this sort of thing. So yes, and which is why I said I think it's so interesting and so impressive that the UK should have integrated itself as well as it has into the European system. To me, that is a, an interesting kind of puzzle. But I agree entirely. I think there is something to that. Stan, thanks very much. Terry Lotz, I'm a new scholar here at the center. Uh, and I guess I find myself wondering beyond Europe. Uh, uh, you mentioned China at one point, but uh, you know, for China and for other countries, uh, you know, the post-colonial revolutionary uh, regimes, you know, non-interference in domestic affairs is a sacred principle. And so, how do we explain their acquiescence, their acceptance of international law? And is there, in your mind, a, a, a real gulf between uh, acceptance? Acknowledging these these principles or values in or norms in in theory and the actual practice. Okay. Certainly, we see that in the constant. You yeah. know, the, and and could we flip that around and say, well, maybe the U.S. isn't so great in terms of its uh, congressional approval of treaties and so forth, but in practice and uh, in in you know the reality, uh, particularly if you if you bring the executive branch into sure. the picture. We're, we're pretty darn good. You know, the yeah. record isn't so bad. And so maybe we shouldn't be quite so hard on ourselves. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think most people aren't. I mean, I think I'm one of the few people worrying about it. <laughs> um, sure, I mean, obviously, there's a huge gulf, and there's a lot of scholarship on this, uh, obviously. Uh, let's take China. Um, Terry is a China scholar, um, and Terry knows this story, but I was in China during Tiananmen uh, 
and uh, I spent five days sleeping on the floor of the uh, uh, airport in Shanghai. And the only book in English I could find to buy, because I ran out of reading matter pretty quickly, was the Chinese Constitution of 1950. So I read that about <laughs> 75 times. And uh, I have it almost committed to memory. And it's a beautiful document. It's an absolutely beautiful document. It's course, absolutely meaningless in practice. So that's a problem we have in law, right? We can have norms, but if they're not enforceable, it's not worth much to the individual. So that's obviously uh, the case. And it's all around the world. It's not just in, uh, in China uh, or other um, countries of that, of that sort. I mean, I spend a lot of time in Cuba now, and a similar kind of problem, really. Sure, so the uh, enforcement is a, is a huge uh, problem. And one of the problems, you know, the most commonly e expressed uh, disappointment with international law is since there is no uh, sovereign, there's no clear way to enforce. And so we set up these international bodies to monitor compliance. It's a hortatory kind of system on the whole. It's very diff difficult to compel people. You look even you know, to the creation of the Treaty of Rome, 1998, of the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Well, there again, um, we did sign. Um, President Clinton signed. But he only signed it because he knew the Senate would never ratify it. And then um, George W. Bush unsigned it. So we're not even formally signed to it, much less ratified it. And it's because we would never give up Americans. Mind you, the treaty says that any country that doesn't want to give up its citizens to the court doesn't have to. Even so, we wouldn't do it. So that there's this tension, two things going here. One is a real fear. All countries fear the loss of sovereignty. We're not unique in that, obviously. But the encouraging thing is I think that internationally there is some cachet to signing on to the regime. And the hope, frankly, is that at least some governments we can embarrass into doing the right things. The Chinese, I don't think so. But some governments we can, and that's the function of NGOs, of the human rights NGOs. But yeah, I mean, I agree. Diego? Hello, my name is Diego Pagliarulo, here at the Wilson Center. Well, I would like to ask you whether, in your opinion, the debate between America and its attitude though, toward human rights, I mean, to what extent it is, it is a debate about the relationship between the Constitution and the American constitutional, I mean, culture and tradition and uh, international law, and to what extent it is a debate about America itself, I mean, hmm. Uh, yeah. To what extent do domestic sure. politics and competing vision of uh, what right. America should be influence sure. America's attitude toward uh, international human rights and systems that try to break them? Right. Uh, it is a very good question, and um, I hope you won't be surprised that I think it's a lot about America. Um, I think the, the Bricker debate was was about that, or I think. Um, if you look at the debate um, just a few years ago about uh, uh, cruel, inhuman, and degrading uh, practices and torture, that was a debate in part about international law. We'd signed on uh, against torture. But it was uh, a debate, I think, about how Americans view national security problems more than it was a debate about uh, international law. But I don't think it's very surprising. I think that's true in every country. Uh, it's a way of isolating what it is you're really committed to. But that's why I've referred a couple times now. Uh, I don't know about anybody else's reaction. I, I have found over the last several months um, it very discouraging to look at uh, to look carefully at American political rhetoric, and I mean popular political rhetoric, because I think what we're seeing is an expression of long-term historical um, attitudes that I had hoped had been muted or maybe transformed to some extent. 
And I am coming to the conclusion that that's not the case at all, and that if you push hard enough on the pressure points of this society, you're, you get the same responses you would have gotten a very long time ago. I took a train from Trenton to Washington for an AHA meeting on September 12th of last year. And uh, so it was a Saturday, and uh, there was nobody in the train when in Trenton when I got on, but they kept announcing that uh, you should take all your books and everything off the seat next to you because the train was going to be packed. I couldn't imagine what this was. There's never anybody on the train. on. Uh, this was 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and in Philadelphia, the train absolutely filled up. And it turned out I was the only person on the train who wasn't wearing a T-shirt that contained either the word liberty or freedom. And the guy sitting next to me was carrying a sign. And, and everybody had a sign. They were all hand-painted as far as I could tell. And my guy had a sign that said, I'm clinging to my colon, Bible, gun, liberty. And so after a while, I summoned up my courage and I said to him, I said, yes, an interesting sign you've got there. Who's going to take them away? And the answer was the government. Wow. You know, and then some kid from some high school kid came through interviewing people. Um, and I was, it was very funny, I'm wearing a bow tie. Uh, he interviewed everyone in the car but me. <laughs> <laughs> and they all, they all said, you know, essentially the same thing this guy. So what it comes down to, I think, is that it reminds us that there is a, a libertarian tradition, sort of small l, libertarian tradition in this country that runs very deep. And it really goes back to these notions, I think, of individual liberty. Uh, you know, to me, sometimes in ways that are bizarre, but I think one has to respect that this is a, a domestic crisis of, of, of kind. So yeah, I think that's, that's what it does show. I think we should probably begin to draw this uh, discussion to a close. I understand whether you would be agreeable to collecting the last uh, questions. Sure. And, then well, I, and I think we may have We may exhausted. have. Uh, that was a very good <laughs> way, in fact, to... Uh, well, at the risk of speaking a second time, I was impressed by the discussion of civil law and uh, common law. And I think most American lawyers would say that practically there's no longer too much of a distinction in terms of how law actually operates between a civil law and a common law country. The difference, though, is, as you suggest, was where you start mm -hmm. the first principles. And that just led me to speculate, since this is a seminar, to what degree this is all attributable to the role of the lawyer. The United States, more than almost any society, has been a legally dominated institution uh, almost since inception, <coughs> particularly in the first generation of post-revolution. And lawyers are taught just as you suggested, a certain way here, which is different than the way they're taught in Europe. And to what degree do you think that plays a role, or is this just too obvious a point? No, I mean, I, it obviously plays a role. Could uh, we collect a little bit? Oh, okay, sure. Are there any other uh, questions? Yes. Well, I'll, double, I'll double dip, too. Um, <laughs> given what, going back to your um, point about the fact that it, you, that, that it puzzles you that, that that Britain, from which we have drawn, so, drawn, have drawn so much, <coughs> entered the European Union. Does that not suggest that other factors must be at play yeah. other than constitutionality? Yeah. I mean, are you being too mon monocausal, perhaps, in looking to that? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, lawyers make a difference. They make a, they make a big difference. Uh, I think not a decisive difference. I really think there is something in the political tradition itself which is very powerful. I've always loved Richard Hofstetter's book on the American political tradition and I think he gets something that's really important and I think to me, you know, as an American historian, uh, what is so interesting uh, is the, the domination of law by by politics, you can turn Tocqueville on his head with this. You know, he says every political question turns into a legal question, but I think every legal question turns into a political question too. So what we have is a nexus between law and politics that I think runs very deep, and I don't think exists 
Mine is a slightly different point. Okay. That an American lawyer is basically trained that there is no universalist principle. Ah, I see what you mean. That in, comma, in civil law, you start with universal principle, and of okay. course, positive rules apply. A lawyer in this country is trained that there is no law unless you can find it. And mm -hmm. it's, they, it starts thus with a negative. And that could influence a conceptual approach that links naturally yeah. into what you describe as the political base. Yeah, but on the other hand, we've been pretty creative in, in um, making law, and both lawyers and judges are, are good at that. And if you look at I don't know, substantive due process, let's say, we, we figured out how to create norms when we, when we needed to do it. We even found a way to uh, infuse some meaning into the equal protection of the laws, which I think initially didn't have much, much meaning to it. But yeah, I mean, there's clearly something to what what you're saying. By the way, you know, years ago when I was at the University of Chicago Law School, Phil Curlin and I um, developed a course on comparative civil procedure, and it was a slightly different interest. But our concern was that uh, American law students and American lawyers knew only the adversary system, and it's really related to the point you're making. They didn't understand that there were other possible ways of thinking about law and justice and uh, adjudication. But the American Bar Association wasn't much impressed by this. And we, we couldn't get them to adopt it. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, we've come to an end, and I think we should give uh, Stan a big round of applause, but not before thanking also uh, Miriam uh, Cunningham and Tim McDonald, uh, 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 who have really helped put this meeting together and uh, make the conversation flow. And of course, my co-chair, Roger Lewis. But Stan, thank you so much. This was great. Thank you, Stan.